So as my colleague mentioned, I'm a human physiologist. Most of you have probably never heard of that before, which is cool because all you in the IB program won't be trying to get my job in a few years. <clears throat> but I'm really lucky. I get to study kids with chronic diseases and kids who are trying to make the Olympic team and win medals internationally. So I get to hang out with the toughest, most dedicated, most focused people. And at the, at the Olympics, CTV was crazy enough to let me speak about this on TV. So I got to talk about it and I was immersed in the Olympics for two and a half weeks, which is really cool because I love sports. And I got to look at all the things that made these athletes so great. And I began to notice something really interesting. I began to notice that they, the champions, the ones who succeeded under pressure, were the ones that consistently did specific things. And I wanted to talk to you about that today because I think that every single one of the things that they did, all of us can do in our day-to-day -day lives. So we can actually live like Olympians on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it all comes down to learning how to use a clicker. <laughs> if I could have the next slide, please. The zone, let me tell you about it. Imagine you're this athlete for years, thinking only of this moment, this race with millions of people watching. Could you handle the pressure? Hi, I'm Dr. Greg Wells. Olympic athletes are a rare and amazing species. They face astounding pressure, yet still find a way to excel. It's all in their brain. See, when their brains perceive stress, it sends a signal down through the spinal cord to scare their bodies into action. Pressure stimulates the adrenal glands. They sit right over your kidneys and release two stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. These hormones make you ready for battle. They make your heart beat faster. They drive blood into your arms and legs. It helps your lungs suck in more oxygen. Plus, they make your liver dump sugar into your blood to give you bursts of energy, which are all great when you're about to compete. But too much screws you up. Get too revved on adrenaline, you lose focus. Get distracted, think about the crowd. Suddenly, you have way more muscle power and explosiveness than you've ever had. You're overwhelmed. And the next thing you know, you're stumbling on the starting line or shooting the puck into your own net. So athletes train themselves to enter an ideal performance state called the zone. They use special breathing techniques to calm their heart and lungs. Plus, they learn how to visualize a perfect performance over and over in their minds. Basically, they hypnotize themselves to will victory into reality. They use techniques to act relaxed and energized, which allows them to think only about their performance and feel confident while achieving it. So they literally train themselves that fear is fun. Don't feel the pressure, feed off of it. Do it right and enter the zone. That's where you find Olympic gold. Thanks. That's, uh, I had a bit more hair in that one than I do now. Makeup does wonders. I'm still not used to that when they put it up here, but anyway. <laughs> the zone in sports is exactly the same as the zone in business, as the zone in music, as the zone in drama, and as the zone in life. And it all comes down to being able to enter the zone whenever we want to. And I believe that one of the most fundamental things that we can do to try to enter the zone whenever necessary is to have this, is to have this great passion for life. And again, if we could advance to the next slide, please. I don't think that uh, it, it's just so, whoops, I'll go back a little bit. When we have this passion for life and when we have this passion for our dreams, we are able to do things we never thought possible. And nothing, nothing symbolized this to me more in the Olympic Games than Petra Majdic. 
She was the cross-country skier who broke four ribs and had a pneumothorax before she went out and went through heats, another heat, a semi, a final to win a bronze medal. And did all of this with broken ribs and the fact that her lung was detaching from the inside of her chest wall. So right here, she's on the far right of that screen, you can see that there's a paramedic behind her. That's because she actually has a tube, chest tube in, and he was pulling air out of her lung cavity to make sure that her uh, lung stayed expanded. They immediately pulled her off this podium and took her to the hospital uh, in an air ambulance. So she used this passion, 25 years of training, to get her through the toughest moment in her life. The fact that her dream of competing and winning the Olympics was being shattered by the fact that she had just a little accident, but she didn't let it get in her way. She focused in on the task at hand and was able to do some amazing things, probably one of the most amazing things that's ever been done at the Olympic Games before, ever. And we saw other people do very, very similar things to achieve greatness with passion. Can we ever forget John Montgomery, the skeleton athlete? I don't want to mention too much about him run, walking through Whistler with beer because I know there's some students in the crowd. So we want to just focus more on the fact that his reaction was amazing. The way that he won and just was so excited. Can anyone forget when he jumped onto the podium and threw his arms back and exploded and cheered like that? We don't get a chance to feel like that very often at work. <laughs> the reason why we get to feel like this <clears throat> every once in a while is because you have this great passion for what you're trying to do. And Olympians set goals, right? This is the key thing, the goal setting piece. But you know what? I don't think that's enough. I think Olympians don't goal set at all. And this goes totally opposite to everything that I've been taught as an athlete, as a scientist, as a prof. I don't think they goal set. I think they dream set. I think that's what it takes. I think you have to take it to another level. Think about what last time that you felt like John Montgomery. It's probably because you achieved a dream of yours, something greater, something that you tried to do for years and years and years and sacrificed for, and then finally you were able to get there, experience it, and then you feel this wonderful moment in your life. And that's how we take ourselves to another level. That's how we become Olympians on a day-to-day -day basis, by just trying to achieve our dreams, trying to achieve our dreams by focusing in on our passions and what we're trying to achieve. Now imagine, if you will, training for years and years and years, day in, day out. Your mother's taking you to practice, she's hanging out in the stands with you, and then right before the Olympics, your mother passes away. Can you imagine that? But Joanny Rochette was able to do something very specific to stay focused on her goal despite unbelievable obstacles. When she went out to perform, the crowd went crazy. Of course, how could you not try to cheer for her? But it made her emotional. She began to lose control. So she turned around and went back to her coach. And her coach was brilliant. She smiled at her. And she got excited and she eye con made eye contact with her. And you could see Joanny calm down. And she did something very specific that led to her being on Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people in the world this year. She took three deep breaths. That's it. The first breath, you could see the tension leave her body. The second breath, she was actually able to smile. And the third breath, she actually started nodding her head. And then she went back out onto the ice and took 58 seconds of the minute that she is allowed to to get set before she began her performance. Imagine if we could do that. Just when things are starting to get tough, when we're faced with a critical performance situation in our life, if we can just stop for a second, take a deep breath, and then approach the performance with composure. What a difference that would make to our ability to reach our own potential and become Olympians on a day-to-day -day basis in our lives. And there's a physiological rationale for this. I'm an MRI researcher at SickKids. This is an MRI of your, not your head, it's uh, <laughs> a head. And you'll notice about halfway down here, right there is our breathing center. Up at the top of this, you can see where we, th the structures in the brain that are respons for, responsible for us thinking. And then the spinal cord. 
And the breathing sensor is right between those two things. It's actually right here at the base of your brain. And what it does is it, all of the information from your head passes down through that area to your body. And all the feedback from your body comes up through that area. And so Joanne taking those three breaths really allowed her to calm her mind, to calm her body. I think that's why yoga is so powerful, is because 3,000 years of trial and error on integrating breathing and movement has led to a practice that allows people to feel amazing. So these things that athletes do have physical and mental consequences that allow them to perform at a high level, but any one of us can do it. We can all breathe properly anytime we want, <sighs> like right now. And we can take this to another level. And we think about Joanie's ability to focus under pressure when things were really, really tough for her. Imagine if you could look at people who are so focused that their entire life could come down to one word. People like Nelson Mandela. And the one word that defines his life. People like Martin Luther King who changed the United States. Mother Teresa, who changed the world. Gandhi, who changed the British Empire. At the time, it covered 25% of the planet. Not an easy thing to do. All because they were focused enough on the one thing that was important for them in their lives. And despite unbelievable obstacles, they maintained that focus. That is critical for us. And it's something, again, that all of us can do, if we know what our dreams are, if we know what we want to try to achieve in our lives. And one of my personal goals in life was to experience it as much as possible. And I was lucky enough to have the opportunity in 2003 to be amongst the first people to take part in something called the Tour d'Afrique. Not the smartest thing in the world that I've ever done, but we rode our bikes from Cairo to Cape Town. My mom was not impressed. She's here. Sorry. Uh, eight of my friends are in the Guinness Book of World Records now for the fastest human-powered crossing of Africa. I didn't get in there because uh, I missed a few days. I got hit by a cow. No. <laughs> but that's not the purpose of my story. That's next year's TED Talk. <clears throat> but what I learned on this trip was the power of positivity. And it's another thing that Olympians are really good at. They stay positive no matter what. And about halfway through this trip, I was in Kenya, and I was really sick. I'd been sick for a while. My stomach doesn't respond well to foreign countries, and I drank a lot of local water in Ethiopia, so I was quite uncomfortable. And it was hot. It's 50 degrees. You're riding constantly day after day in camp. You're dirty. The food is uh, just whatever you can find. It was really, really uncomfortable. And there was one morning that I was riding, coming off the back of a mountain in northern Kenya, and... Uh, it was a gravel road, I had the wrong bike, and I'd had four flats in the first 10 kilometers of the ride that day. All my friends were gone. I was getting really frustrated. So I got the fourth flat, and I just literally lost it. I picked up my bike, and I launched it into some trees, or bushes, I should say. And these guys stood up. <laughs> so some Samburu warriors were hanging out in the bushes, apparently. And <laughs> they had spears and now they have my bike. <laughs> but the cool thing was that they took me back to their village, and I uh, got to hang out with their entire uh, family. The chief of the village came out and played music for me. And I'm all by myself in northern Africa in a village, and people are bringing me tea and playing music for me. So the, one of the worst days I thought that I'd ever had turned into one of the coolest experiences ever in my life. In addition to getting married, my wife's watching on <laughs> TV. Glad I remembered that one. <clears throat> <laughs> anyway, it turned into one of the coolest experiences in my life. And it reminded me that you, you have to have open expectations with life. Things are not going to go as expected. You have to be able to take things as they come and apply the principles of dreaming, of staying focused, and constantly being positive under pressure. If we can do this, we can change the world. We can change ourselves. And the final story that I want to leave you with today is one that's absolutely critical for me. It's hard for me to get through. But I also work at the hospital for sick children. And... I study cancer, 
And one of the kids that I work with, worked with, uh, had this great statement that she used to make as she was going through chemo, as she was going through radiation. She said, cancer, you can't let cancer ruin your day. Imagine that from a seven-year-old girl. You can't let cancer ruin your day. So if she can do it, if she can apply the principles of dreaming, focus on your goals, on your dreams, and staying positive under pressure, anybody can. Thank you very much.